why is he always oiled up? Why does it look like he, somebody's lubed him up in each one of these photos on set? Oh my God, there must have been an on-set lube guy or gal. I wonder how much they got paid to lube up the Wolverine. Welcome back to the channel. I'm Michael DiNicola, and in this video, I'm gonna be giving you five really easy tips for drawing superheroes, so stay put. Okay, five super quick, super nasty, no, not nasty, super quick tips. <laughs> They'll be as nasty as you choose to let them be. Let's start off with thumbnailing. Thumbnailing is super important to your composition. You wanna know how it's gonna look small, so you know how it's gonna look when it's all blown up. You wanna figure that stuff out right out of the gate. Figure out what that background is gonna look like in loose broad strokes in relations to your figure. Can't stress that enough. Figure out which one's gonna be best. I like to give myself around three to five thumbnails and then really try to mix them up. Really try to change things around, change the camera angle, change the position of the figure, change where the figure is in relation to the entire um, piece, just to see what works best. Make sure that the background and the figure are working together. At the end of the day, it's all lines. You want those lines to direct your viewer's eyes. You can't do that unless you have them working uh, together. Next, next tip, next tip. Dynamic posing. Put that leg forward. I believe they call that contrapposto. That is not particularly important. However, if you just leave your hips and shoulders parallel to the ground, the figure's going to be boring. We're doing, we're doing superhero stuff here. So it's got to be, it's got to be dynamic. And by that, I mean, rotate the shoulders, rotate the hips, put one leg forward, put one leg backwards. Put you know, put a shoulder forward, put a shoulder backwards. Really, really try to trick the viewer that what you're looking at is something three-dimensional, even though it's only two-dimensional. Which leads me to my third tip, which really, really, really pushes, pushes the dynamic posing that much more, or shortening. If you look at this image, his, his left clawed hand is closer to the camera than his right. So I made it slightly bigger. Now, I don't know how realistic this is or how realistic it isn't, but you're going to want to push for shortening when you're working on an image. The closer the object is to the camera, the more you can push for shortening. For example, if his claw was facing the camera, I could push it so that it would taking up the majority of the frame and the rest of him would be quite small. So I've talked about composition, I've talked about dynamic posing, and I've talked about a little about foreshortening. All these things are to draw your viewers' eyes as well as, like I said before, trick them into believing that what they're looking at isn't something two-dimensional, it's something three-dimensional and exists in this world that you're making. And another one of those tips that help in this regard is line variation. If you look right now, you'll see, and I don't know why this works, but it does, so you're gonna have to take my goddamn word for it, Lines that are in the foreground are the biggest and darkest. Lines in the background are the thinnest and lightest. Why does this work? I haven't the foggiest fucking idea, but it does. I'm sure there are very, very, very technical, uh, beautiful explanations as to why. Who cares? We don't want to know why the hammer works. We want to use the hammer and put those fucking nails in the wall. That's why we're here. I'm handing you the hammer and the nails. That is, lines in the front are thicker and darker. Lines in the back are thinner and lighter. I'm sure it's got stuff to do with like the atmosphere and whatever the hell else, who cares? Lines that are in the shadows are thicker and darker than lines that aren't. Look, at, if you look at his right leg, the lines that I put underneath his thigh, which is more covered in shadow, are going to be a little bit darker than the top part of his leg, which will be in the light. Same thing goes with the top of his head and the top of his back slash shoulder. Where the light hits, the line is light. Where the shadows hit, the line is dark. Real simple, real easy. And all that does is work to making the viewer believe what they're seeing truly exists in this space. Make sure that it's interacting with your background, which leads me to my final tip for y'all. My final quick, quick and nasty, dirty art tip. Lighting. Where's your main source of light? Where's your secondary and tertiary source of light? Do you guys know about ambient occlusion? I barely do. Essentially, it means light bounces, right? The main source of light in this piece is going to be 
from him, him in the back here. Originally, I set this to be moonlight, but I switched it up after the fact. But re regardless, moonlight, sunlight, whatever, interior light, I'm having that bounce off the water and up underneath him, but primarily shooting him light from behind. What's going to hit him? What's going to light up most? Any part of his body that's facing that in this image. So top of his head, back of his shoulder, his claws are going to have a little lens flare on them. And there's going to be some light shooting up, bouncing off the water up underneath him. That's called ambient occlusion. That's a much deeper conversation for another day. <laughs> also, the light's going to be bouncing off the reflective hard parts of his costume. It helps make it look really fucking cool, but also it really does help sell that he's exists. He's existing in three dimensions. As promised, those are my five quick and dirty, nasty, super extra fast tips for drawing superheroes. <laughs> if you want to see more of that, let me know like actual full, full blown videos of tips because uh, that's something I could do. I mean, I don't know how good it's going to be, but I could definitely do it. This next half of the video, I'm going to be talking about stuff that I love about the character Wolverine and Hugh Jackman's portrayal of him and how awesome it was. I almost said the F word, but I didn't. Now I want to turn my focus to the Wolverine as seen on as seen on TV. No, we're not talking about 90s Wolverine from the cartoon show. We're talking about the big screen. We're talking about the one, the only Mr. Yusuf Jackman, <laughs> Mr. Huey Jack, as I'm sure his friends don't call him. His version of the character is, well, it's iconic at this point, which interestingly enough, people weren't into when he was first cast. He was too tall. He was this, he was, he was too thin. And when you look at those early movies, he really was really thin, man. That guy was, um, oof. He was like a quarter of the size that he is now, or at least he was during those last couple Wolverine movies. Because as we all know, that motherfucker got swole. Holy shit, dude. Look at this beefcake, dude. Look at those bags. Why is he, why is he always oiled up? Why does it look like he, somebody's lubed him up in each one of these photos on set? Oh my God. There must have been an onset lube guy or gal. I wonder how much they got paid to lube up with the Wolverine. Not my point. Despite his beautiful, sweltering, smoky hot bod, he completely enveloped the role. So much so that I actually feel bad for the next person that's going to take the reins of this character. Because good luck. Those are not easy, beefy shoes to fill, sir. Just think about Logan. I want you to, I want you to think about that first X-Men movie and how campy it was and how it's indicative of the time, I believe it went to pre-production in the late 90s, or at least the very early aughts. So that that movie, it looks like the time that it was made in. <laughs> I mean, it really does with those shitty leather outfits. If you look at that version of Wolverine, when you contrast that to the version of the character that we see in Logan, holy crap, it's like night and day. Not just in the portrayal of the character himself, which has grown, but also with Yu's version of Wolverine. You could tell that he, as an actor, has grown in leaps and bounds with this character. He's truly made Wolverine his own. He's added such complexity to the role. He's breathed such life into it. And that movie is so good. It doesn't only transcend X-Men films. It transcends the genre. The entire superhero genre is moved forward because this is a excellent, it's an excellent movie. It's a heartbreaking, beautiful, whole movie. Not a superhero movie, just an excellent movie, period. When you Jackman says, hey, I'm not doing any more of these because, well, one, the workouts are too fucking intense for my now aging body. I've said all I'm going to say as this character and I've ended it's, I've closed the book on Wolverine on this. I mean, imagine the last we ever saw of Hugh Jackman, not ever, but portraying Wolverine was in Logan. What a finale. What a finale. I, I couldn't imagine going out on a higher note. With all that said, we are living in the time of the multiverse. Literally the next Doctor Strange movie coming out is Doctor Strange and the Multiverse of Madness. All the, all the reports coming out of Hollywood, all the rumors, screaming at us that the multiverse is the talk of the town for both DC and Marvel. And what, what that means for these movies is that every iteration of the character is possible ever. That's what the multiverse means. That's what the, multi that's what the multiverse means in comic books. When you pair that with what, with what would honestly be a really, really fat fucking paycheck, 
that might be enough to entice a Mr. Jackman back to the role. Now, obviously not the Logan that we watched pass in the movie, you know, the titular movie, but maybe we might actually get the, the real old man Logan because they have all the parts now. Remember, Fox couldn't have even fathomed doing an old man Logan because they didn't own really any of the characters besides the X-Men and like a few choice others. Now that Disney owns that, they own all but I think the Hulk and a few Spider-Man uh, characters, but really, they could do old man Logan as you know him from the comic books, which would be mind blowing. And also personally, personally, I would love to see Wolverine interacting with Deadpool. I just, I wanna see it. I want Spider-Man to be there too. The, com the giant comic book dork in me can't help but, but wonder and wish that one day on screen we'll be able to see that. And I think that's slowly but surely more and more likely of happening, only because when you hear the, the current rumor is that Ryan Reynolds recently signed a huge deal work for Disney as Deadpool. So we're talking about not just one or two Deadpool movies, a bunch of Deadpool movies, probably some X4 stuff, as well as him appearing in other Marvel movies. Like, well, the possibilities really are endless. You could really throw that dude in just about anything as a quick one-off or even as a cameo. But let's not forget, Ryan Reynolds is also super buds with you, Jackman, who knows? We might actually see those two interacting after all. Which in my humble opinion would be pretty fucking awesome. Huge, 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 big. No. <laughs> big thank you. God damn it. Big thank you to everybody who's been liking, sharing, commenting, subscribing. Everybody who's on my Discord, people who've been catching me on Twitch. I'm streaming four days a week, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. If you want some merch, if you want some prints, if you want a piece of me more so than this, the links are in the description and I'll see you in the next one.